Good morning, folks. This is Jonathan Shaw. I just wanted to let the group know that it appears we have a forum. So uh, it's 9.03, uh, just to let everyone know we're ready to proceed if, if everyone's ready. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I just got the uh, good to go message as well. So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our quarterly meeting of the Information Technology Strategy Board. So I am Jim Weaver, um, brand new to North Carolina here, and Jonathan's already confirmed the, uh, the, the quorum. So we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order, um, and I'm going to go ahead then and just make some opening remarks for everyone's benefit, and then we'll get into the meat of our agenda. So um, this is day five, actually being in Raleigh. Um, <clears throat> have been uh, part of the uh, Governor Cooper's administration since the 11th. Um, as I made the cross-country uh, uh, journey here to Raleigh. So first, let me apologize, because apparently since I arrived, the 70-degree days and the sunshine seem to have disappeared, and instead we got nothing but rain and uh, other uh, nefarious weather. So I will take the, the hit for that and apologize sincerely uh, to my colleagues here on the call for that. I'm thrilled to be here in North Carolina and the opportunity that North Carolina has. So a little bit about my background. Uh, I've been in information technology probably too long. Um, I'll, I'll just say more than 32 years, and we'll leave it at that. But um, a lot of my experience has been um, within human services. So 29 years of my career has been spent in information technology within the human services arena. Um, and I'm, you will see that I'm very passionate about human services, um, especially when you hear me talk about my family and the fact that my youngest stepdaughter, who's 12, has Rett syndrome, is disabled, categorically disabled. Um, and the challenges that my wife endures, um, because I'm here in North Carolina and previously in Washington, um, and, and uh, you know, on the day-to-day -day basis of, um, of my stepdaughter, and uh, she's the most beautiful, sweetest girl you've ever seen. It's just so unfortunate. Um, of her disabilities, but with that said, that does not mean anything different, and uh, we love her uh, very much. Um, so I, I spent 29 years in human services uh, when the uh, Governor Wolf's administration came in in the early part of 2015. The then uh, identified state CIO asked me to come over and join the central IT organization, in which I was the Commonwealth's chief technology officer, or basically his deputy CIO for just to kind of put in, in that type of terminology. And we spent three years uh, uh, very fortunately to be able to do things like IT consolidation, IT optimization. Um, we were able to get a number of significant enterprise projects underway. Uh, as you can only imagine, uh, we were operating in an outsourced data center environment since the end of the uh, ninth, or yeah, 20th century, actually before the turn of the century, um, and, and continue to do those types of things as well. Uh, we were continuing our cloud migration journey and beginning to get a substantial amount of workloads into the cloud um, and leveraging the, the cloud capabilities that exist. Um, 
Governor Inslee in Washington came calling in 2018 and asked me to join his administration out west. And so um, with the approval of my wife, as you can imagine, uh, made the journey out west and spent two and a quarter years with uh, Governor Inslee. Um, and, you know, the operating environment in the west coast is radically different than the east coast. Um, you, you cannot imagine the differences there whatsoever. Um, so in, uh, in Washington and likewise in Oregon, California, the information technology arena is extremely decentralized. Um, and we began to start uh, changing that culture a little bit and starting to bring some optimization, most importantly around enterprise visibility and enterprise accountability of what was going on there within the state. And, and unfortunately, we, we, we did incur some very high profile cyber related incidents. Um, I, I, I think our state auditor is here on the line, but her, her counterpart here in the state of Washington actually had a massive data breach occur. Um, and as I was leaving the state of Washington, um, the, the, the state auditor there, uh, Pat McCarthy, um, was still um, dealing with the fact that about 1.6 million unemployment records that were in her, her organization's care got breached by a bad actor. Um, as they were leveraging a, a platform that was being transitioned from, and uh, bad actors were able to go in and obtain those that type of data. So, um, you know, cyber is something that's extremely important to me as well. Um, I'm excited to be here in North Carolina, like I said, and working with Governor Cooper and working with the great folks here that are in the Department of Information and Technology. Uh, you will see that I am not one who wants to sit back and and uh, talk about a problem at at ad nauseum. Um, I'm a kind of person who likes to recognize problems, go focus on what those solutions are for that problem, and then let's go get something done to address the problem. I'm very much focused on public service, and at the end of the day, we are here to all serve the residents of this state, and I take that, um, that charge very seriously. And you'll see that in some of the conversations I hope that we have a little bit later on um, as we go through the things. I know there's been a lot of frustration um, especially over the past year in 2020 with maybe the lack of progress that this group has been able to make or maybe the amount of um, influence that this group has been able to make as far as um, advising on strategic um, issues and concerns as it relates to our state. Um, so I look forward to having you all re-engage and we'll talk about that here a little bit later um, as we go forward. But at the end of the day, my goal here is to start having some type of an action plan that we can begin to move forward with. So when we do come together on quarterly meetings, we actually have an agenda that's substantial, that we have stuff that is relevant, and we have things that we need to discuss and, uh, and get recommendations and your respective advice from your various uh, roles um, within the state of North Carolina. So I welcome that. Um, you will see that I do welcome feedback. I, I'm probably more of a direct person, um, and please don't take any of that out of, out of character, but the only way we affect change is if we're willing to actually have the hard conversation about what's wrong, do the necessary self-reflection, um, and then go ahead and make a, an educated decision as to what we need to do, and then let's go ahead and, and move forward. So I think that's enough about me and, and some thoughts. I'm going to turn over here to Jonathan real quick. Uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, Strategy Board Authority. So, Jonathan. Good morning, folks. Uh, most of the members are returning members, so I won't take very long to discuss uh, the, uh, the bylaws and our, our statutes governing the Strategy Board. Uh, they're very brief. Just for a brief review, of course, uh, the DIT statutes are located in Article 15 of Chapter 143B. And specifically, the DIT, or excuse me, the Strategy Board uh, statutes begin in Section 1337. Uh, they call for the establishment, of course, of membership of the board, uh, that the board have quarterly meetings, of which this being the first one for the year, that we adopt bylaws, which we will get to in just a second, and then uh, Committees and technical advisory groups, which is germane to the conversation today. We'll be talking a little bit more about that, I believe. Uh, and then sort of the overarching idea of the statutes is that the, the, the strategy board, of course, is an advisory board to advise on policies and procedures for the state CIO and uh, to advise and 
assist uh, with this establishment of committees and ad hoc uh, technology groups. And so we adopted the bylaws about a year ago, and those bylaws are available to be reviewed. Um, and, and actually, uh, should I think it's worthwhile to take a look at those, at least on a yearly basis, to make sure that they're still um, that agreeable to the board. Um, but specifically, the bylaws create, well, the statutes create and the bylaws flesh out the establishment of IT uh, committees. And uh, each one of those committees must consist of one voting member of the board. Uh, it could also have other members that are uh, employees of state agencies uh, and members of the, uh, the public with particular subject matter expertise in uh, IT. And uh, we also have uh, the ability to create uh, technical advisory or ad hoc advisory groups. Uh, and each one of those committees and uh, advisory groups are um, they're essentially going to be non-voting for matters of the entire board, uh, but they're really there to establish, uh, uh, to be able to break out into smaller sessions and to be able to really dive in deeply into the issues that are before the board and uh, before the state CIO. And uh, that's that pretty much concludes my my summary of where we are with our uh, the statutes and our bylaws. And if anyone has any questions or whatnot, I welcome those at any point in time. Thank you. If I could, please, uh, when it comes uh, for my benefit, I'm sorry, I was muted there. Uh, could I have the voting board members maybe come on camera if possible and introduce themselves so I, I have a name and a face, um, and I would thank you in, a, in advance for doing so. Jim, good morning. This is Rocco DeSanto here. Good morning, Dr. DeSanto. Good morning. This is Linda Combs, State Controller. Uh, good morning, Controller Combs. Morning, Jim. This is Keith Warner with the UNC System Office. Oh, great. Good morning. Morning. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. This is Mark Edwards, Acting Secretary over at DOA. Okay. And can we just, as a matter of course, drop the Secretary part and just call me Jim, please? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. Good morning, Gerald Poplin. Good morning, Gerald. Hi, Jim. I'm Tracy Futhi coming from in from Duke University, where I'm the CIO and uh, happy to uh, just go with the first name as higher ed tends to be that way. Great. To okay. Meet you. Thank you. And I guess I'm a fish out of water because I made it very clear. I root for Coach K and I wanted to do my first video today session from Cameron Eco Arena and I was told no way. So, yeah, uh, you're, in, you're in serious <laughs> trouble. Uh, you and I should talk privately, not in public or uh, in, in uh, your, your shot okay. of it. Yeah, just to let you know, I, I am a Coach K fan. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Keith Briggs. How are you this morning? Good morning. Hey, Jim, this is Joe Abernathy. I'm a CIO for Blue Cross Blue Shield. And oh, great. comments about Coach K, I am going to have to resign from the board now. <laughs> <How you think? laughs> Just kidding. You might can, can guess where my uh, where my degree came from. That's that's fine. Uh, actually, I'm a huge Penn State guy, to be honest. But uh, when it comes to basketball, I do like the, the Blue Devils. And just a quick story, my staff, my first senior leadership team meeting, I think they all had wolf pack or uh, car heel clothing and hats on just to rub it in. Um, yeah. As well. And I've already heard the digs about. So who's in a tournament? Um, so <laughs> and, and not to not to chime back in, but it might be only you and me by the end of this call, Jim. I think everybody's going to follow <laughs> Joe's lead. Nice okay. to meet you. And anyone else? Oh, go ahead, sir. You, you might be muted. Is that it? Now I'm off. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. That sounds like a Sprint commercial. Uh, <laughs> Jim, I'm Jeff Tart. Actually, my name's spelled wrong, and I don't know if I did that or what have you. But um, as background, I have kids with four degrees from UNC, so a little bias. But since you're a Penn State fan, I am actually an Illinois alum. So 
at 115, I'll be planted firmly in front watching my fighting Illini uh, play basketball. Okay. Well, just to prove it, here is the Penn State face mask. So, uh, well, there you go. Well, I have my Illini Illinois uh, cufflinks on today. So, okay. Well, when Big Ten, when the season starts up, I'm sure we'll talk more. Auditor Woods, I, I see you on camera. Good morning, ma'am. <laughs> Good to see there you. we go. I'm unmuted. I couldn't get myself unmuted. Good morning, Jim. Welcome aboard. Um, Beth Wood, North Carolina State Auditor. I've been the state auditor now um, for, I'm in my fourth term. Um, I'm CPA, um, auditing. Um, Federal grants is probably my area of expertise. I have uh, taught CPAs across the nation how to perform governmental audits. I um, probably like 30 years ago, I hate to say that in my career now. Yeah, let's just say we're seasoned. I hate to say how many years we're seasoned. I, I like that. Um, Dr. Paris, I see you're here. Okay. Well, if that's everybody, then uh, let's go ahead and, and start talking about uh, some of the work that you all have been working on from before and uh, and the committees that were under consideration. Uh, but before we go to the, the committee consideration, I, I would like to talk a little bit about an area that I as state CIO would like to focus on. And I think in a lot of cases, it's an overused term, but digital government. Um, we're all here to service the residents of the state, the, the, the supplier community in our state, uh, the tourist industry in our state, et cetera. And when I think about digital government, digital government to me is not about state agencies saying, I got all this great stuff online and this is how you consume it. We have to talk about it from the other side of the table. I'm a resident of the state. How, do, how, how are you making my life better? How are you making a profound impact in how I interact with government? Because I'm a firm believer that government exists to provide critical services. Agencies exist to enable those services, and candidly, IT is batting third. We're not batting lead off. We are there to underpin and enable agencies to be successful. And I believe that wholeheartedly and sincerely, and you'll see that um, as well as, as we go through our, our communications and conversations. I do not want this committee to be focused on technology, and that may sound weird. But at the end of the day, we have to talk about people, process, and then we talk about technology because the technology solutions that are out there will shake out to uh, give us to the best, the best technology that we probably need to embark upon to meet the needs. But if we don't have the people part of the equation right and we don't have the process part of the equation right, um, it, it doesn't matter what the technology is because then technology becomes a shiny toy that people go out and spend a lot of money on that does not provide the value and the benefit for what its intended purpose is. Um, and I'll, I'll just use an example from my past experience in the, in the state of Washington, the, the legislature wanted to put together a task force to focus on uh, blockchain. Blockchain is a great technology. Um, and there's a lot of great use cases for blockchain and, and probably the most appropriate ones in the state of Utah where uh, title registration of vehicles, they were look, doing like some phenomenal work with uh, leveraging blockchain as a, as a technology to expedite that entire process. In the state of uh, Washington, that is done by third party administrators that would get replaced by this technology. And if we weren't willing to modify that process, what would be the purpose of introducing that technology and spending time on that technology? And so that, that's just, and I, I want to use that as an example where we really need to talk about people, process, and technology. When you think about something as fundamental as in the state of uh, North Carolina, how many places do you need to go to as a resident to change your address, right? This is not a technology problem. It's a people process problem. And the technologies are there to support that. Um, even going back to the turn of the century, there's technologies there that could do that from the, uh, the more traditional enterprise service buses to, um, my gosh, we can do RPA now. We got chatbots that can do this kind of stuff. It's not about the technology, but are we as a state willing to embrace and look at how do we service the North Carolinians a little bit differently? And these are just some of the things that we talk about. When we talk about identity and access management as an example, I could be a, a resident of the state. I could be a state employee of the state. I could be a small business concern in the state. 
Am I three separate identities or am I one identity with three personas? These are some of the things where I, uh, I would like us to maybe have a conversation around as we think about digital government. And digital government to me has four pillars that support it. Uh, first and foremost, something near and dear to Governor Cooper's broadband. We need connectivity, right? We cannot have anybody getting left behind. And to me, connectivity is really around accessibility. It's around affordability of the service. It's around uh, addressing the digital divide that exists or digital inequity, whatever word you want to use. And then we, we may even have a digital literacy problem. Those are things that we need to address to make our, the residents of our state more functional in a digital society. I, I think everyone here saw the announcements this week about um, the biotech firm that's coming in to, into our state. Uh, Google is now uh, putting in another thousand jobs for an innovation hub. This state is going is, is a high tech state. Um, and I will tell you that viewed across the country, it is a top 10 state when, when looking at it from a state IT perspective. That, that may like shock some of you, but I came from a state that was viewed in the bottom 10 percentile, um, and I can, I can uh, accurately say why that would be the case. So I'm truly excited about the capabilities that are here, the private-public partnerships that exist. And we look at the board member composition here uh, from the uh, education arena, from the private sector arena. We got some really, really sharp people and brilliant minds sitting here that how can we go start doing something a little bit different and not necessarily talk about technology, but how can we start making things a lot better and a lot easier for the residents of our state? So I know we had some, uh, so besides uh, broadband, I want to go to the other, cybersecurity is a huge issue, um, you know, and cybersecurity is more than necessarily just blocking the bad actors from coming in and, and accessing the state data. Um, as we've enabled more of our children to be online for education, the bad actors are out there taking advantage of that situation. Um, we, thought, we talk about identity access management. How many IDs do you really need to engage in government, state government services here in North Carolina uh, to, to do what you need to do? And that's just at the state level, and then I'm sure there's probably some things at the municipality level that need to be addressed as well. Um, privacy is another issue. Um, and I, I know we do not necessarily have a robust privacy program yet in play, but this is one of the things that's on my to-do list that I would like to fo focus in on because cyber and privacy go hand in hand. Um, you know, we need to start looking at uh, privacy concerns from a consumer protection component. And our colleagues up north in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia just signed a privacy bill that was largely modeled after the privacy work we were doing in Washington uh, based upon GDPR. So. Again, maybe that, that's an area that we need to focus in on as well. And then lastly um, is a technology item, and that's around cloud computing. The more we can make things accessible in the cloud, the more we can take advantage of cloud concepts and the cloud capabilities that exist, the better we will be for the, for the state when we talk about continuity of operations, we talk about disaster recovery, we talk about um, allowing our residents to be connected at any time from anywhere to be able to access the stuff they need to do in a cloud, um, uh, from a cloud uh, perspective. So when I talk about digital government, it's kind of like in a, in a snapshot. That's kind of what I'm thinking about uh, across those four pillars, if you will. And, you know, uh, I, I use the stool analogy. You can't do it without all four. You take one of those away, the stool collapses. And we need to harmonize and make sure we're working across the board uh, across those four areas. So I do know that there was three committees, I believe, that were identified in your previous work. And I think some of them kind of resonate in there with that. And one was around cybersecurity. Um, and, I, and I know we have some challenges here in our state from cybersecurity. You, you also have one of the best programs across the country, I will tell you, for, for North Carolina. And I'm very proud. And I've, uh, I've admired Maria's work. Um, over the years, I've used North Carolina as an example in the state of Washington for what we should be aspiring to. And uh, as I said to the governor, I finally realized that if you can't beat them, join them. So here I am uh, to, uh, to take advantage of all the great work that uh, Maria and others are doing from a cyber aspect. But we also got to be able to make sure we're able to extend those cyber services out and, and be able to address our municipalities, our, our children, that we're not inadvertently leaving anyone behind. Um, IT infrastructure funding, um, I, I know that was identified, but I think uh, in fairness to our colleagues at OSBM, I need an opportunity to talk to them a little bit about what I see as the funding challenges and the funding models that uh, Department of Information Technology needs to look at. Um, 
as, as we move forward because there is a cost of doing business uh, when you look at it from an enterprise approach. And sometimes uh, one, one stop, one time funding streams are not ideal. We really need to start looking at how do we extend some of these services over a five year life cycle and make sure that we have the sustainability of that service over a five year period and not just focused in on a one or two year period. Um, so that's an area that I would like to do some more work with our colleagues in OSBM as we move forward as well. And then uh, lastly, as, as I understand, there was an enter enterprise project oversight uh, enhancement. Um, so I, I know here in DIT, we do have an EPMO function, um, and that's an enterprise project management office. Maybe one of the things we need to consider, and I'm just throwing this out there, so when we get to the discussion item, is not necessarily a project management office, but maybe a program manage op management office. And there are very subtle differences to that. Um, we need to start focusing on the bigger portfolio of services that are being offered as opposed to individual projects that are supporting um, that portfolio. Now, I know there's, uh, I imagine here in this state, as there are across the country, there's a lot of concern about these big, uh, costly IT modernization efforts that, that are underway and how they get funded. And, and relatively speaking, what is the success rate of them and how much those costs overrun and, and different things of that. So I do appreciate that aspect. And uh, we will um, definitely be talking about that more. But um, what I don't want to see happen is here in North Carolina, <clears throat> and I don't know if this is occurring today or not, so please uh, understand that. If we already have three things doing the same function, why do we need a fourth? Right? Um, can we can we get to 80% of the problem being solved already because we already have that capability, and then we focus on the 20% difference? So again, just some concepts out there, and and giving you all an idea of how I think and and feel and, and react. So, Tracy, you have your hand raised, so please go ahead, ma'am. Thanks. Um, I wanted to first thank you for those opening remarks, Jim. I think uh, to me, at least, they were very uh, well received, right? And and thoughtful. I especially appreciate uh, what a, a wise guy when I first came to Duke many years ago said: "Technology is easy; people are difficult." Um, and so I think your notion of people and process really gets to the heart of all too often people light on the technology. Gee, blockchain's the new cool thing, uh, mm -hmm. rather than thinking through what's the actual problem we're trying to solve. So I'm really glad you're going to take that approach. Uh, one comment I would make, and I don't think it's necessarily for today, but it's towards some of the conversations we've had in the past and some uh, an issue we may want to talk about or you may want to wrestle with within within your uh, structure and uh, with the governor. And that's the question of the, the scope and purview of this activity. Um, even though you described East and West as a big difference being decentralization, my sense, at least from a citizen's perspective, is that um, the the state office takes care of much infrastructure, but many of the actual applications and the actual digital enablement that you or others of us might seek to do may reside in areas under other parts of, of the, uh, the branches of government in, in the state. And so this, I think, gets us very quickly to the question of identity management, which is you know near and dear to me as an area that we really need to transform in a tactical sense, why don't we yet? Why aren't we one of the states that's going for a digital driver's license, as you know, a, a handful or a dozen others have? And and then that quickly gets me to the question of how many identities do we have? When do they get uh, uh, provision, so to speak, to the to the citizenry? And what a difference it could have made for um, uh, for vaccinations and otherwise, right? If every citizen, including the, the six-year-old school student, had the identity. But I don't quite know where and how that's actually perceived formally or informally as in our purview to either identify as a priority and push forward or to try to influence with help and engagement from other parts of the state uh, siloed, maybe. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. I don't mean it to sound bad, but, you know, we all face silos in our IT environments and decisions about functions are made in functional units and not fully and directly connected to the strategy of the state uh, IT strategy board, then I'm not sure we can be as effective as we might be at the broad level. Uh, okay. No, thank you for the I, I, I wasn't trying to drag us into that conversation now. I know you have a great agenda, but I think it's one we're going to have to hit real quick or else we're going to feel like our, our hands are tied, so to speak, in what we can actually okay. propose and do. 
No, thank you for those comments, and that's the kind of feedback that we need to be, at least I need to be listening to, and that feedback may have been provided, but, um, you know, I'm fond of saying there's a reason why the rearview mirror is small and the, and the front window is big. I want to be respectful of the past, but I do not want to dwell on the past. I want to, I want to move forward. And so just as a matter of perspective, I, I come from an ITSM background. So things like service strategy, design, transition, operations, service improvement have, mean things to me. And uh, as my team here in the agency is, is you know, is learning, I, I do talk in, the, in that type of terminology. How do we decide it should be done? How do we go about uh, seeing if we, uh, you know, how, it, how it could be done? How do we go about seeing if it can be done? And then more importantly, then how do we put it in production? And then how do we get that sustainment loop where we make that decision whether it's something needs to be enhanced or candidly just killed and, and we go in a different direction? And what I want to make sure that we're not doing is if, if the design calls for a circle, we should not be trying to take a square and pound the heck out of it so it fits into the circle. We should stop and go back and do a circle. Um, and if that design is wrong, then we should not continue forward. We should go back and get our, our ducks in a row, so to speak, and, and get it get it right. And you know, I know that there, you know, the you know, in private sector, it's fail fast, right? That, that's that's a mantra. In public sector, it's called fail once and you're done. <laughs> um, and I want to kind of change that culture a little bit because there are going to be times where we might embark upon something and it's like, this is not going the way we need to, and let's cut our losses. Let's do something totally different. And, and I'm, I, I will tell you that as state CIO and assuming uh, the governor's support and, and others across the cabinet, that, that's my approach as well. We're not going to go do something just because we're going to continue to pound away at it and the bureaucracy is going to direct this is how it gets done. Um, so, yeah, thank you for those comments, and uh, we will factor that in. But really, at the end of the day, what, what I'm looking to try to do is, is how do we redo our governance structure? Right. So how do the decisions get made as to the what architecture is the how? And, you know, you, you brought up a great point. Application development is not necessary within my agency. And you know what? I will tell you that I'm probably OK with that. And the reason I'm OK with that is because we're not embedded in the business. We're too far away from the business. Right. Um, it just so happens I have 29 years and I can go talk to Secretary Cohen about a lot of things that her agency does because I have that business knowledge. No different than probably Secretary Boyette, when he was in my role, was able to go and talk about uh, transportation type stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not there sufficient enough to be able to understand the business challenges, the business outcomes, and what needs to be done. And so I, I, I wouldn't be respectful of that. And when I look at probably the continuation of consolidation, optimization, centralization, whatever the right words are for that discussion, um, I'm probably going to be looking more at a hybrid approach. There are a lot of things that we should be probably doing a little bit differently and getting into that shared services model um, and do it once as opposed to doing it 10, 12, 15, whatever times. And that to me is technology convergence. But there are some things, though, that we do need to enable our agencies to just go do. And so that architecture framework is going to be huge for us to put those guardrails in place to allow agencies to operate within uh, and, and get to the outcomes that they need. So, again, my, some of my thoughts in that area. Okay. Um, so at this point in time, I think I'm going to quit talking because I want to listen and, and listen to all of you and uh, your observations, your input, and I think to help us along, uh, Warren and Julie here we're gonna, are going to help facilitate some conversation around committees. And I, I, I do want to caution, I, what I don't want to necessarily see, uh, and again, my viewpoint, uh, I will listen to everything you all have to say. If we form 10 committees, we're probably not going to get a single thing done. If we get two or three committees, I'd rather get two or three committees or even one or two committees and we actually get some work products accomplished as opposed to having 10 committees and we do a lot of talking and, and not a lot of work. Um, so with that, uh, Warren and Julie, if you want to go ahead and take over from a facilitator perspective and take us to the next part of the agenda. Yeah, thanks, Jim. So we're going to go ahead and uh, share the screen here. And so what, what you have up on the screen are the four committees that uh, Jim just walked through. And what we want to do in this, sec in this segment is um, just understand what you as the board 
uh, hope what impact you hope to have with these committees just uh, first and then decide uh, what you feel is most important to get started with. So um, before we get into that question, when you look at these four that are up on the board, I uh, want to just ask, are there any questions for clarification when we look at these four um, cybersecurity, infrastructure funding, um, enterprise project oversight, enhancement, and digital transformation? Any questions for clarification first uh, for Jim as he walked through these from the board? One quick comment uh, about infrastructure funding. Um, there has not, to my knowledge, there's been no mention of, uh, of, of actually uh, making it easier for rural areas uh, to secure the funding for infrastructure. And this is all going to have to start in the legislative building by changing some of the the rules and laws that now exist and of course i'm referring to uh, hb 129 that needs to be amended or repealed and replaced with something else and i actually have been working in the background trying to do that but uh, throwing money in infrastructure isn't going to really solve the problem if it doesn't get to where it's supposed to go and right now, as a matter of fact, uh, there's more money out there uh, available than there are contractors to actually do the work. So all this is, these are things I think that need to be looked at. Uh, I don't know if uh, having a legislative liaison committee is uh, uh, something that should be considered or not, but certainly in the conversation about infrastructure funding, we do have to talk about it. Great, thanks. Let, let's go, um, if we could, let's just look at this, this one in particular a bit more. And when we look at infrastructure funding, you know, what, our question for the board is around what are the other, what, what kind of impact, what are your hopes for impact that you wanna have with this committee's work? What would you wanna make sure comes out of this? Gerald, Gerald could you remind me real quick what 129 is? Gerald, you're muted. You're muted, Gerald. I apologize. HB 129 was a bill that was passed in 2011. Uh, it was called uh, Operation Level Playing Field, but if it was anything but that. What it did is it pretty much prohibited any municipalities or counties from doing anything to either provide their own internet service or to attract anybody else. It was designed to protect at that time, Time Warner, Windstream. Uh, and what it did in effect was create oligopolies uh, that uh, as we now know uh, had, in other words, they, they were looking at the bottom line. All they wanted to do was make a profit. And to do that, they focused all their and concentrated all their investments in urban areas or areas of high density and uh, rural areas like Stanley County, Montgomery County, Anson County, uh, all pretty much were ignored and nobody really paid any attention to it, of course, until the pandemic and people were trying to work from home. People were looking at telemedicine. Uh, we were looking at school, uh, you know, doing their work online. So, HB 129 has been there forever, but the lobbies in Raleigh for the cable industry were so strong, uh, you you dared not to, to talk about it. But obviously the mood has changed now. Uh, if there's one thing that good that did come out of the pandemic, I guess that was it. And uh, so what we've got to do is create legislation that makes it easier for uh, municipalities and counties to do whatever they need to do to attract other ISPs other than the big boys who really don't have our, or at least rural America, uh, have our interest at heart. So I hope, I hope that answers the question. 
It, it did, Gerald, and, and I just want to throw this out here real quick, just to make sure we don't go in a, a direction that's not necessary. I learned yesterday that there's $2 billion coming from the federal government for counties, 2 billion for counties. Um, and it can be used for um, broadband, water and sewer, um, the school education building, um, and one other uh, mental health. So I just wanna throw that out there. When you talk about going to the General Assembly for money, there is $2 billion coming into the state from the federal government. We have no control over how the counties are gonna spend that. Um, but I'm just gonna throw that out there that that money is coming in and it's coming in fast. The other piece of it is, is that I think the state of North Carolina is gonna get around five, five billion. I'm, I may be off on that number, but there's a lot of money coming into the state of North Carolina that we can, it's coming from the feds, that we can <coughs> supplement what the counties are doing. And so I'm working on with the County Association of Commit, Association of County Commissioners um, to help drive those monies in the right direction for a broadband and then use some of the money coming in to the state that can go to the counties, that will go to the counties that the General Assembly will control to get them to do the right things with the money. That's the $2 billion. So it may not even necessarily be a part of appropriated dollars out of our state's budget right now because all this money is coming in from the federal government if we can just funnel it in the right direction. So I'm just going to throw that out there that all this money is coming quick and it's a great opportunity for us to use it on these rural counties if we can get them to do the right thing with the money. So, but I think that also the point that was being made, if we have uh, some legislation that ties our hands, so to speak, at the, at the point of the municipalities and what and how they can do, then we will limit the number of options we have. Um, is, I think that's the point you were, you were making is, is that right? Yes. And just to add a little background and history to HB 129, it is also helpful to understand what the impetus for that is. And sometimes, as we know, we have unintended consequences. So that's limiting options, perhaps. But that was related. HB 129 was an outgrowth from this town of Davidson and Mooresville buying the Adelphia cable system as it was going out of business. And as mayor in Cornelius, the sister city, at the time that discussion was going on, they wanted the four towns, including Huntersville and Cornelius, to join in. We would purchase the system and then run it for three to five years and be able to flip it for a huge profit by selling it back to one of the major operators, private companies. Uh, at the time, because the infrastructure was so old, services was failing and it almost bankrupt the city of Davidson. Cornelius and Huntersville, we decided not to participate. We didn't need to get in a private business uh, as a community with, and because there's issues around tax advantages and so forth. Uh, to offer like services to compete, that Mooresville was also being drained financially. Their uh, percentage of their budget was disproportionately paid into that. They couldn't keep up and invest in the infrastructure and the R&D, and basically were, uh, went through a lot of financial angst because of that. And HB 129 was basically a bill to prevent other cities from making the same mistake. Uh, does it need to change perhaps, but again, that's the history of why it came about. And so we've also put that as just uh, some more information about HB 129 in the chat too for folks. Other, uh, other comments, um, you know, again, with this particular proposed committee infrastructure funding, other impacts that you'd want to make sure you got out of this committee things to make sure that, uh, it accomplishes, it focuses on. Just want to open it up to other board members. Let me just throw out one comment and, and it would be good to hear from Comptroller Combs because Linda, you faced in, uh, you have a great appreciation for the, again, the angst and the effort to go about funding a major statewide um, IT project by in implementing a brand new ERP and very difficult to get it properly funded. Uh, to move forward, and I don't know if Linda, you have any comments about that process that we went through. Well, it's, um, it is, it is difficult and I think 1 of the things that. I would say to begin with that I've been looking for since I've been controller, which has now been almost 7 years. 
is a pathway. I would like to have uh, come in as controller and realizing the need that uh, we had immediately we recognized we were dealing with a 30 year old accounting system and that it was going to go out of service and uh, we were we were going to be left with nothing. So we immediately started work on that and it had it took a very, very long time. Uh, thank you, Senator Tart, uh, for what you did while you were here to help out to even get a tranche of money 500,000 to begin exploration of that. And then the money came in in very small pieces afterward. Those are not the best conditions to go in a 90 to $120 million project. We need a pathway, in my opinion, that is agreed on by the administration and the legislature. This would be the ideal. I always look for the ideal solution to any problem first and work backwards as to how we have to get there. But the ideal solution would be to have agreement on, for example, the accounting system being the structure of our administrative areas in government. Seems to me that uh, is a slam dunk when you know you're going to be out of service. But yet, uh, the money comes in small tranches and if it could just be agreed upon and allocated yes we're going to spend between 90 and 110 million dollars on this over the next five years that's that would go a long long way to relations with the legislature and the administration i believe so i i would very much like to uh, to thank the legislature for what they have given us but it really has uh, not been an ideal process, but we're, we're getting there anyway. You can solve problems in many different ways. And we've used uh, what we've had efficiently and effectively at this point to, uh, to make the changes that we knew we needed to make. So I would certainly recommend some sort of long range plan. I think that's what this strategy group is for. Uh, to decide on some long-term infrastructure projects, look out ahead three years, look out ahead five years, and see what is what is the necessary things that come to do with infrastructure within the administrative part of government, as well as the people and the processes that we have um, to make a lot of progress with, and we've just heard about a lot of those human resource type projects and projects across the state. So I think we have to have a comprehensive idea of how this money is going to be spent, especially the amount of money that uh, the auditor talked about and that we all know is coming our way, as she called it, fast and furious, because it certainly is that. So we've got some great opportunities right here. And I think that people around uh, this cyber connection today can, are the ones who can help help resolve that. So thank you for your input. So, and I, I just wanna to add to that. I, I helped a little bit. I certainly didn't take on what Dr. Combs did, but I helped um, somewhat to lobby for the new accounting system um, down at the General Assembly. But what I heard often from them well, two things. Number one, we don't know how much this is going to take for sure, and they do not want another reach of NC tracks. That project it was a new Medicaid uh, billing system, um, accounting, whatever, and it was supposed to cost around, it started out $267 million, going to take two years. I think it ended up taking six years, and it cost almost $600 million. And it was a and and it was on the wrong platform or it was written in antiquated language or whatever so the general assembly wants to be assured that these projects if you say 90 to 120 that that's exactly what it's going to cost and it's going to be done within a reasonable amount of time that you stated it would be dr combs has done a great job of keeping this on track but it's one of the few in the history of the state of north carolina that's been on track and is going to come out to cost about what 
she said it would. So again, just for this committee to know, and I think this is where the strategy board will work well, is if you come to them with a project, big project, they want to know what it's going to cost the state, and they want to know that you're going to bring it in somewhere close to that budget and that time frame. And she is one of the few, if not the only one that I'm aware of that has done exactly what she said she was going to do for the amount of money she said she was going to do it for. Any other? So, so again, I was just going to say coming up with the project is one thing, but assuring the General Assembly this is about what it's going to cost and all it's going to cost. And this is the time frame that's going to be built in or come on board in. And then this board making sure that those projects are going to land where we, they say they're going to land. Right. Any, any other board comments on this proposed committee? And if we could go up and we're, we're just capturing the comments here, um, just kind of scroll up a little bit. Any, any other hopes that you want to have for this committee work or any, any, any other comments? Just, just one comment as you're filling each one of these areas within the mind map or whatever, just realize that many of these topics are going to transcend to other areas as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank, thanks for that. <clears throat> So uh, why don't, if we could, let's shift over to uh, the cybersecurity proposed committee. And uh, again, we, we have uh, just some notes around what the potential scope and focus of this committee would be. And, and again, I think we want to understand from your perspective, what, what kind of impact you want this committee to have? What's important to you? What's the difference you want it to make? So just open it up. Okay, I'll kind of start to throw this open. I would love to hear from our two current CIOs. Uh, I, I'm serving as a CIO for an engineering firm right now as well, but I'd really love to hear uh, from Tracy and Joe because they're living it every day from an operational perspective, particularly in an area where data privacy is paramount. I think for us, one is knowledge and on what understanding what the cybersecurity issues are at the state level. Obviously, we're getting fished and hacked on an almost daily basis. I think there's some background information that at our levels as a board would be helpful. Uh, the Verizon uh, data breach report, which uh, came out a month or so ago, I think February, it's been done for the last 13 years, is an excellent piece of documentation to understand. Uh, it's a research uh, on cybersecurity data breaches for the past 12 month period that occurred over 81 countries that report on it. And it gives us, uh, it gives an individual a pretty good oversight what's going on in the cybersecurity area. And maybe so some foundational material and what issues as maybe Jim, you were saying, let's solve a problem is, is there a problem in cybersecurity? We mentioned Maria Thompson's been doing a great job or did a great job uh, to date, but what are the go forward issues and where do you need our involvement or focus would be helpful to help guide you guys. Thanks, Jeff. Do other folks want to jump in um, and just uh, add to, to Jeff's comments here? Hey, this is Joe, um, and I apologize. I have got to drop off at 10. I've had something very urgent come up that I can't avoid. You know, um, obviously, municipalities have become a primary target with regard to ransomware. And um, one of the things that was a little troubling to me last year when we had a cybersecurity topic on the um, on the board agenda was there didn't appear to be a level of kind of robust minimum standards that everybody had to adhere to. And I know that's something, you know, I talked to Tracy about and she said, well, we try to give each agency autonomy. But to me, that's fine if you want to do that. But I think there's if there's one area that you want to insist on, everybody has to buy in and meet minimum standards, it would be cybersecurity. So I, I would like to understand kind of what is the plan across, I don't know this person, Marie or whoever you mentioned, what is the plan to have some sort of minimum standards and a robust layered, you know, cybersecurity protection across everybody um, versus sort of letting everybody federate and do their own thing. That, that would be a question I would have. 
And I, that uh, makes sense. I'd like to Jeff, add, if, if I can add on to Joe's comment, because I, I'm, I am a state agency and I do work with Maria and DIT on this. Um, and I would agree, but I also think there's segmentation. Uh, we started, or Joe started the conversation about municipalities. And there's segmentation that's happening within the state of North Carolina. And when we look at, at citizens or consumer customer safety when it comes to cybersecurity, um, there are segmentations that don't, that, that no one entity kind of supports, is knowledgeable about, about or, or whatever. That segmentation could be a local, like a city uh, or, or a county. And then you have uh, state levels, then you have private. Regrettably though, we're all sharing information and we're all sharing injection points um, for infection, you know, whatever. Uh, so I, I do think that, that this, this committee could help drive some of those base standards, if nothing else, recommendations. Uh, part of the part of the challenge of being a state agency is is we're busy delivering services that is the charter of that agency. We're not busy funding or implementing or growing our cyber capability, even though around us the risk grows every day. So it's huge. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, Keith. So Keith, Keith, can I uh, can I add on to that, Keith? I'm sorry, I had a WebEx. My uh, tablet had all kinds of issues, so I'm on a different device. So I apologize, uh, Keith. What I want to make sure of though is, is if we're funded a dollar for cybersecurity, we're getting the net effect of a dollar, and that that dollar doesn't get watered down because it gets cut up so many different ways that the net effect's a nickel, and what everybody does is go does the same thing. Right. So, you know, the obvious areas that people focus in on and I'm talking from past experience, I'm not talking about here necessary North Carolina. So please uh, forgive me if I'm giving the wrong impression. But what what I've seen in the past is, is that the legislature funds us a dollar and the net result is pennies on the dollar because everybody goes out and did the same thing. That's not giving us death and defense. That's not giving us that quick reactionary force, if you will, to go respond to cyber incidents. All that is, is we're building a bunch of fences. Fences get cut through very, and, yeah. and so yeah, I just want to make sure that we we are maximizing the the investment of the taxpayer dollar being provided to us as a state when we look at cybersecurity and and trying to do something holistically for the benefit of the entire state. And I couldn't agree more. And, and, I, and I respect your you know about counties, municipalities, state agencies. Yes, we have to bring all that together somehow. If it's yep, not already on the path for that. Yeah. I would agree, uh, and I think there is a significant amount of waste in duplication of services, whether that's cybersecurity, whether or not it's hosting, whether or not it's application development. There's a, there's a there's there is a funding model, and then there's a duplication of that same need over and over and over again, and then there's no assurance that any of it is being done right. Uh, so I, I'm 100% on board with you on that one, Jim. Chime in and just contribute something to like one of the, the majors or the hope for impact. Uh, one of the things I think last year when we had the presentation from Maria that she uh, had up was a, a graphic that showed the incidences of attack, but also what came out in that uh, was that some of the municipalities or entities that might have had ransomware or other attacks um, did not avail themselves of the state security function. And so I think that's a, a huge risk for all of us and a, and a huge area of necessary improvement. Uh, and by that, I mean, we, we need to not only focus the dollars as, as Jim talked about so that we get the best benefit out of them, but also uh, apply and bring to bear the expertise where we have the most benefit. And with all due respect to all of our municipalities that cannot be at that local small level. Uh, and so finding ways that we marshal resources and even the marshal them more more broadly than the uh, the the state. Uh, you know, we, we, there was something that happened in Durham, and and we sent our IT security folks from Duke down to help. So figuring out how we get all hands on deck, no matter where those hands are, and independent of the uh, separation and the municipal local local municipalities versus uh, state entities. Thanks, thanks, Tracy. Yeah, one thing I was going to add on cybersecurity is everybody having an appreciation where they occur from because 
35% of all cybersecurity attacks on a municipality or county originate within that city. So it's somebody down the street doing it. At the state level, it's over 56%. So cyber attacks on the state, over half of them are originating within the state. And we all think it's China and Russia doing a majority of this. And it's 85% uh, of the time, it's uh, cyber attacks are within the same country. So statistically, you know, we have to figure out how to protect kind of our backyard or the things. Another thing that would be interesting to check on, because at least this used to be true, I don't know if it still is, but if we engage the National Guard in our cybersecurity effort, part of the task force, a formal engagement, that gives us as a state legal access to the NSA and what they do in that area. And not that, you know, the, what resources we really need but uh, it opens us to an opportunity to have access to a much greater depth of knowledge set in this area, at least for the state level. So, so Jeff, I, I probably should have uh, commented on that in my opening remarks. So as of last Wednesday, I was sworn into the North Carolina National Guard, so my transfer occurred, and I will be working with Colonel uh, Felicio um, on the National Guard side, who's the J6, G6, uh, and has really been focused a lot on the cyber uh, response activities from a National Guard component. Uh, and obviously, obviously working very closely with Secretary Hooked on, on from a, um, the public safety side of the house. So I, I think there's a lot of capability there. Um, you know, I would tell you when you were talking about attacks, I mean, you would be surprised when you when you look at a threat map. The United States is top countries where malicious activities occurring from, not because it's script kiddies or script babies, whatever you want to call them, sitting in their parents' back, uh, basement, sitting there doing nefarious things. But because of the number of compromised machines that actually exist in the United States, um, you're still looking at your top five actors being uh, Russia, China, uh, Iran, North Korea, and then, believe it or not, Israel. Uh, Israel leverages cyber from an offensive weapon weaponization aspect as well as a defensive nature as well. Um, and a lot of, interestingly enough, a lot of cyber companies are based out of Israel. Um, and so... It, so yeah, we, we have that, we have that. So I think there's a lot that we can do here. So I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues on the National Guard side here um, and how we're able to do things a little bit differently. Um, I will lament with you that, um, and I think Tracy, to your point, I found out about a lot of non-state government related cyber incidents through Como News. Watch the news in the morning. And there is a greater likelihood of a municipality being targeted because, candidly, they don't have the wherewithal on how to combat a cyber incident, and they will pay. And, you know, that's something that we need to also focus on, that we should not have anybody in North Carolina paying ransomware um, as, as an option. We should be putting all boots on ground to go and do what we need to do to take care of uh, – a fellow municipality or county government, whatever the case may be here in the state. We got the resources and the assets. We should make use of them. Any, anything, anything else uh, before we're going to shift to the third committee, but anything else on cybersecurity in terms of impacts that, that you want to make sure you have with this work, with this committee's work? Yeah, if, if I can throw something out there, and I don't, maybe this is done and maybe Maria has it already, but have the local governments um, a local entities availed or have put together a list of this is what we would like the state to maybe do. That was one of the things in Washington we were working on with the, um, I think here it's the County Commissioners Association that might be the one in the organization, League of Municipalities, I think the other one. But those two, um, you know, uh, in Washington, we got a top 10 list. You know, these are things that you as a state, there's low level hanging fruit like help us do penetration testing, help us with an incident response model or a framework. And then there was the more complicated things where, hey, we may want you to come and mitigate or remediate a cyber attack. And then you have your indemnification. That might, that's going to be a little bit longer or larger issue. We may need legislative help. Um, I, I don't know, you know, you know, the nuances here in North Carolina, but that is something I would like to do if Maria has not done that already is to better understand how can we help um, our local entities, school districts, you name it, to, to be better prepared and then more importantly, be there at time of need when something does go boom. Okay. 
So we've got, we've got these captured. I'm, I'm going to shift us over to enterprise project oversight enhancement here. So we've got, this is the third proposed committee. Um, we'll go ahead and make these uh, notes just a little bit bigger here. Um, again, same question. What's important? What kind of impact do you want to have for, for this committee's work? I think we, you know, from my perspective, maybe a little bit more definition. It's, it's, it may be part of the data gathering or whatever, but definition of what, what, you know, what's out there right now. And then standardizing, simplifying, scaling, I think is kind of what I'd like to uh, propose we address. Standardizing, simplifying, scaling. Just say, can you say just a bit more about that? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, if we look at any, if we look at anything as part of a fund and waste fund with a D, not an N, fund and waste challenge, meaning, you know, whether or not we, we uh, implement a new solution with an infrastructure, whether or not we implement new, something new in cybersecurity, whatever, part of the overall cost of doing that implementation and requiring or consuming the fund is this right here and whether or not we consider it you know partially sunk cost and investment of trying to get to a point of, of approval and then ensuring the integrity of the product during the life cycle maintaining budget all that stuff to me if you want success in all your other buckets you've got to have this thing operating effectively first right so um it's important. And I think the other thing that we don't typically think about around EPMO is what is the actual cost of operating a, an EPMO? Is it is it really streamlined? Is it effective? Does it does it add weight to the team that's trying to implement the pro, the infrastructure project or does it take weight off of it so that it can focus on what they need to do? Um, this is a critical function for the state. And if we treat it without trying to 